morning, Vertical Church. Uh, I'm Pastor Ricky. I've been hanging out with y'all for the past now three weeks now. And man, I pray that, uh, that, that, that this series, Psalms in the Key of Life, has been giving you all life as it has been giving me life. I thank you for Pastor Ryan Brooks who's allowed me to come and be a part of your family for this month. And he's getting some good rest. And today I'm excited to preach God's word. Hopefully it will inspire and remind you that the Lord really is our shepherd. So before we do that, let me pray. Father God, I pray again, Lord, to, to speak with my mouth, to think with my mind, to make everything I do pleasing in your sight, God. And today, for those who are watching, God, that you will remind them that you really are our shepherd. You really are our protector and our God. You really are the one who cares for our soul. So, Father, rest with us. Holy Spirit, be in this time. In Christ's name, amen. The story was about a great black preacher by the name of Dr. E.V. Hill. While doing a preaching conference on the East Coast, he then would take a plane back to the West Coast. He was tired. He had preached all weekend, and now he sat on a plane, and to be honest, he didn't want anyone to bother him, so he did the international sign of not bothering me. He opened up his Bible and held it and read it. And he flipped to the page, Psalm 23. And there he sat on the plane, and this four-hour flight, he found himself stuck on a phrase phrase was, the Lord is. Dr. E.V. Hill found himself contemplating, could not move forward past that, that phrase, the Lord is. He was stuck on the isness of God, that God is what he was. He is who he is, and he is who he, who he shall always be. Dr. E.V. Hill now sat on this plane for four hours, and he was stuck on the isness of God. In fact, he would tell Moses, I am that I am. That God lives in the eternal now. That there is not a space in time where our God does not exist and his footprints are not found. That, that God exists in the eternal now. And Dr. E.V. Hill now, sitting on this four-hour plane ride, finds himself stuck contemplating on the phrase, the Lord is. In fact, I believe that David, King David, found himself stuck also on this idea. David now is sitting back on his throne. He's now a man of old age. He's been through some things. He's been through mountaintops and valleys, and he's seen God provide for him, to seen God love him and, and protect him. And he sits back on his throne, surveying his land, and he comes to the conclusion, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 23rd Psalm. In fact, it's probably one of the more famous psalms in the Bible. In fact, probably one of the famous scriptures in all 66 books of the Bible. It's, it's, it's one that even non-Christians would have known, especially Christians would have probably recited this verse over and over in their younger years. It, it, it's, it's a verse that we all know. The Lord is my shepherd. But if the Lord is my shepherd, why am I still wanting? Do you feel that tension there? It's, it's where the Bible says one thing, but the realities and the pains of life say another. It's almost as if, if the Bible is going right, then the Word is telling me to go left. God, I know you are my shepherd. Why am I still wanting? God, you, you know I wanted that job to provide for my family. God, you... You know, I wanted that special someone to spend the rest of my days with, God. You, you know I asked you to, to heal my body from this cancer so I can yet see my family. God, since you are my shepherd, why am I still wanting? That's a real question that many of us face. The idea that though, God, you call yourself my shepherd, it seems as if in life I'm lost. But in Psalm 23, I think David's going to bring us back to, bring us back in and remind us and show us that God really is our shepherd. That, that God really does protect and provide and care for his sheep. 
In fact, today he will show us three important things. First, he will show us um, that, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Second, he will show us that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. And last, he will show us that since the Lord is my shepherd, I shall dwell with him. I have entitled this message, Surely Goodness and Mercy. As you uh, turn to Psalm 23, let me set the stage for you. David is now sitting back on his throne. He's now envisioned peace for the rest of his life. He's conquered his enemies. He's, he's faced some valleys. He's faced some hardships like trying to avoid King Saul who tried to kill him or even facing the dangerous giant Goliath. And he sits back on his throne contemplating his life. And he comes to the conclusion that every step of my life, even in the hardships of life, God, you led me. Even when it seemed as if life was going to crumble at my feet, God, you were there. And he picks up the pen of inspiration and dips it in the ink of illumination and writes the 23rd Psalm. Pick me up, Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I can only imagine as David writes this, he's contemplating on the goodness of God, thinking of all the ways God himself provided for him. Maybe it was Courage to defeat the giant Goliath, or maybe wisdom to defeat King Saul. But if there was anyone who understood what it meant to be a shepherd, it was David. For the Bible calls him the shepherd boy, meaning that David knew what it meant to be a good shepherd, that a good shepherd knew a sheep. He knew what they were going through. In fact, he knew what they need even before they even asked. David knew that what it meant to be a good shepherd was to take care of the flock. In fact, uh, in fact, in the Middle East, uh, shepherding is an age-old profession. Shepherds knew their sheep so much that they would even name them. And David says, um, when I look back over my life and, and what all I've been through, what all I face, I realize that you have been with me every step of the way. And so because of that, you truly are my shepherd. Vertical Church, let me just remind you. God is your shepherd, that, that God knows what you're going through. He, he knows your needs. He, he knows your pains and your suffering. In fact, Isaiah would say that, that you are engraven in the palm of his hand, that God knows what you need. And so David says, the Lord truly is my shepherd. Funny here, um, this word shepherd was often used in the Old Testament. And so uh, when, when read in the Old Testament, it, it really meant to, uh, uh, to, to have someone who was a distant deliverer, someone who was there to save the day, but they were distant from the body, distant from the people. David says the word my. Uh, that's the most intimate metaphor that we encounter in this psalm. David says God is not on his throne hoping life will work out for Ricky Harris. No, but, but God now steps off his throne and he is in the very details of my life. David says that God truly is my shepherd. He knows me. He walks with me. He talks with me. And he's simply saying, God really knows who I am. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Uh, David's talking about now the spiritual nourishment that God's Word provides its soul. Hear me. God does provide physically, but also spiritually. David is saying, God's word is nourishment to my body. It's spiritual nourishment to my soul. For God's word is never barren. It's, 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 it's always there, always green. In fact, he would also say that, 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 that in the Psalms, he would also say that your word is sweeter than the honey on the honeycomb. It's the idea that the, 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 the partaking of God's words gives my, my, my body and my mind strength. He's saying that, 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 that he makes me lie down in green pastures. It's the idea that when you're walking with God, God has a way through his word to ease your soul. 
Then it says he leads him beside still water. Honestly, you all know that life has many raging storms and raging seas. But it's the idea that for you and I to walk with God, he has a way of allowing those waves and allowing those seas and allowing those fears and those storms to begin to see. The disciples on the boat, middle of the ocean, middle of the sea, Christ says, peace, be still. The idea that, 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 that the raging waters were around them, but because Christ was on the boat with them, he had the right to calm the seas. In fact, shepherds oftentimes would, 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 would lead their flocks to a river, but sometimes the, the water was too tough for the sheep to drink, so the shepherd would dam up the river, allowing his sheep to drink. God, God is our shepherd. Right now, many of us are facing some real hard times, some real confusing times. Sometimes you're just going, God, it seems like I'm constantly walking in a storm. I'm constantly walking in raging waters. And God says, <laughs> stops and allows his children the ease of drinking. Do you not hear Matthew eleven twenty eight? Come to me. All who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sometimes the sheep were so tired that the loving shepherd would gently nudge them to rest. Sometimes the most loving thing God can do is force you and I to slow down. So many of us are on the highway of busyness. Got four or five kids, working a full time job. You're, 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 you're trying your best to live out the gospel in your neighborhood. You're trying your best to live out your dreams. You're trying your best to be a good neighbor. And it just feels like you're in this nonstop highway where everyone constantly is pulling and draining out your energy. And God says, sometimes, son, daughter, I have to forcibly make you sit down. Then it says, um, he leads me and passes the righteousness for his namesake. I love this. David understood that, that the good things he had done in his life were all because of God being with him. David understood that, that God was his shepherd, and so a good shepherd leads his sheep to all good things. Vertical Church, this is where I'm worried for all of us, including myself. We have the tendency to, to take credit for the good things we do, but we forget to cite our source. That's called spiritual plagiarism. When you and I begin to be prideful of the good things God allows us to do without thanking him and being humble, we are spiritually plagiarizing the goodness of God. David says, when I look over my life and all the good things I've been able to do, it is all because I did not forget to cite my source. And my source for doing good was God. I think by this time... Um, most of you wouldn't disagree with this sermon. Most of us like to know that God will provide for us, that he will lead us beside still waters, that he will allow us to, 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 to graze in green pastures, that he will lead us beside uh, 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 and, and, and all in the past. Of right. we, we love hearing the blessings of God, but hear me. What if I told you that the blessings in verses 2 and 3 are all predicated on verse 1? You can't receive the benefits of God if you are not his sheep. And maybe that's why many of us are not seeing the benefits. of God. Because many of us may not be his sheep. I'm not trying to be rude here. I'm not trying to be mean here. But what I am saying is you cannot claim the benefits of God if he is not your shepherd. True story. Her name was Garbage Mary. If you had met Garbage Mary during the course of a day, you would see her digging through trash cans. Garbage Mary stayed in a small shack in a small neighborhood, and she would spend her days doing what she would do best, digging through trash cans and collecting that said trash. But one day, a neighbor got fed up with it, tired of seeing it, and so they called the police. They came to arrest Garbage Mary and take 
her back to the precinct. And for the next few hours, they would burn their computers up trying to figure out who she was. After a while, they gave up and decided to take Garbage Mary back to her shack. Unbeknownst to them, as they walked in, they would see mounds and mounds and mounds of trash. They would spend the next few hours digging through that said trash, trying to figure out who she was until they came across something interesting. They came across um, files and files of files of, 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 of oil uh, inquiries. They came across bank statements up to $400,000 apiece. See, Garbage Mary happened to be a daughter of a well-to-do lawyer in the Midwest. Come to find out, Garbage Mary was a, was a millionaire. She had untold wealth at her disposal, but she could never claim what was rightfully hers, all because she did not know who her father was. So here's my question, Bertha Church, for those of you who are watching who may not be Christian. Is the Lord truly your shepherd? We cannot claim the benefits of God if we do not know who our Father is. And the gospel says that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose, that all who might believe in him may have life to the full. And so if you are not a sheep of God, let me invite you to the shepherd who provides and takes cares of his sheep. Because if not, you can't expect God to move on your behalf if you're not his. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He also says next that not only is the Lord my shepherd, I shall not want, but then he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. Look at it with me, verses 4 and 5. It says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Yea, though I walk through the valley. We've left the green pastures. We've left still water. We have now turned away from the tranquility of verses 2 and 3. Now we find ourselves in the valley. How do we get here? I wonder what's going through David's mind. Maybe it's him um, thinking about his life constantly being in the balance. Or maybe it's the shame and guilt of killing a man just to sleep with his wife. If there was anyone who understood that the valley was real, it was King David. David knew what it meant to wake up with guilt and shame and fear, all staring him in the face. In fact, he was saying, 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, is only one step between me and death. We're not talking about a man who doesn't know what it means to have his life threatened. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, let me just remind you, that the valley of the shadow of death is real. Depression, real. Cancer, real. Dementia, real. Fear, not making enough money. Family turning on you. Can't catch a break. D David says, this isn't for those who live on the suburbs of, of hardships. This is for those who are right dead smack in the middle, feeling the, the pain and suffering of life. David said, 
I am walking in the valley. This is where it gets interesting, though. In verses 1 through 3, um, David says the word he, third person. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He uh, makes you lie down in green pastures. He uh, leads me beside still waters. He, he, he talks about God in third person. But once he steps foot in the valley, he no longer says he, he says the word you. As if he's saying, I found myself in a situation that I, it's not enough to just talk about God, but now I'm talking to God. God stops becoming an idea and starts becoming a person. He's saying that in the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have time to talk to he, I only can talk to you, meaning that God is closer to him in the valley than he was when life was right on the mountaintop. That is what David is saying right now. He says, no longer he, but you. It's as if life has to often hit us for us to see God for who he is. My favorite pastor is a little short black guy named, uh, by the name of Robert Smith Jr., he says, um, when faith is stripped to the bone and all your props and crutches are gone, it is your faith in God that he is good and still on the throne, which is the only thing that keeps you going. When faith is stripped to the bone and all your props and crutches are gone, he's saying, when faith is stripped to the bare bone gristle." And all the, the things you used to use to prop yourself up when life was hard and all the folks you used to call just to give you comfort, they are all gone. You find yourself by yourself. There are times in life when no one else can give you an answer to ease your heart. When faith is stripped to the bone and all your props and questions are gone, it is then when your faith in God that he is good and still on the throne, which is the only thing that keeps you going. David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I still trust you, I still walk with you, and that therefore you shall be with me. Sometimes you don't know God's enough until he's all you got. Sometimes you don't know God is enough until he is all all that you have. What if I told you in a weird way that the valley was kind of good for you? What if I told you in a weird way that sometimes the best thing for us is suffering? Um, I asked you earlier, how did we get here? How did we get in the valley? Well, <laughs> the same spirit that led Jesus to the wilderness is the same spirit that leads us to the valley. Ricky, that, 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 that sounds blasphemous. It's not. The valley teaches us to view God rightly. And what you're missing here is that just as just when David was on the mountaintop eating from green pastures and still waters, the same God was with him then, it's the same God is with him now in the valley. David said the one stable thing was the fact that you were with me on the mountaintop and with me in the valley. David says, the beauty of Psalm 23 is the reality that no matter what terrain I find myself in, you are there. So, 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 so church, why should we feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. So a couple years ago, man, um, me and about 10 of my black pastor friends, man, we decided to kind of do a vacation. 
And so we went to uh, Montana. You're probably saying, why 10 black guys go to Montana and it's none of your business? Don't worry about that. But, but, but so, so, so we went to Montana. A friend of mine knew somebody who had an 11,000 acre uh, ranch. It, I mean, beautiful, man. Just lush green grass. I mean, it, it was gorgeous, man. So, you know, so we get out there, man, and, and you know, and we talk to the guy. And he says, hey, man, listen, man, I'm excited y'all here. Have a good time. Just know that we got some uh, mountain lions on the premises. And I'm like, wait a minute. Um, mountain, I'm, 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 let, hear me. Black folks, we don't do wildlife. We, we just don't, okay? You will never hear Tremaine or Darion being killed by a bear. That's just that I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm helping you understand me. So anyway, so we're not we're terrified, right? But we, you know, we, we make it happen, man. We make it happen. And so, but, but anyway, so we, you know, we get past all that, get past all that. And so we finally, you know, get back outside, man. And, we, and, and man, we're in this lush green valley. Man. I mean, just beautiful, man. But, but then I look up and there's these beautiful snow caps. I mean, just mountains all around. And so we have to just kind of hanging out. And my mentor says, uh, he says, Ricky, uh, don't stare too long at the snow caps. <laughs> like, Why? He said, because um, life can't sustain that high up. But in the valley, there's food. In the valley, there's food for your soul. It's the idea that sometimes the best part of your life is not when everything is going well. but that God can provide for you even in your darkest of times. So if that's the question, why do you and I run from the valley of my life? Why are we so afraid to walk in the valley? In fact, David says, it's but a walk. David says, This is not supposed to be a marathon. The valley of the shadow of death, David says, is simply a walk, meaning that this shall not always be. What you are going through right now shall not always be. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and the old black folks in my church would say that God is a lily in the valley shining bright as a morning star, meaning that even the darkest of times, I can have hope that this shall not always be. David says, I'm simply taking a short walk through some darkness, but I know in the end that my God is there with me. And if that's the case, vertical church, maybe it could be good to stop trying to run away from the valley and trust God in the valley. Faith that is not tested is no faith at all. Faith that is not tested is no faith at all. How do you know you have faith? If it is being tested. How do you know you can stand strong on the rock of my salvation? It only happens through test. So maybe when James 1 says, Consider it pure, dear my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, for you know that it is persevering and growing your faith. Maybe he's saying that hardships and valley moments in your life are actually gifts to you. There's proof, they are proof that you really are a follower of Christ because you're being tested to walk away from him. David said, Yea, though I take a short walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. So I want to encourage you. Some of you right now are in some real valley moments. And I'm not trying to be, I'm, I'm being honest. Some moments where you just can't get out of bed. It, it, it feels as if the whole world is caving in your chest and you can't breathe. You're getting phone calls from here and text messages from here and folks need this and folks need that. And and it seems as if, God, I can't catch my breath. Valley is real. 
And that's why I love the song. It forces us to realize that since the valley is real, how do I respond to it? I think it takes a mature Christian to have um, what I call a, 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 a faith that sits at the bottom. It, 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 it's a faith that deals with the tough stuff of life and still been able to trust God in it. It's a, um, a faith of adversity. It means to, to look at God from the bottom up, from the bottom up of cancer, from the bottom up of injustice, from the bottom up of oppression, from the bottom up from not having any money to pay my bills, and to still come to the conclusion that God is still good. It's a faith of adversity. We've got to have some faith that deals with the even those shifts of life. If your faith is never tested, how do you know you have it? Most of our faith rides on verses 2 and 3. But nobody wants to have faith in verses 4 and 5. And David says the beauty of God is that though I would love to stay at two or three, when I, when I am in four and five, the same God that was with me there is with me here. I got to move on. Um, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. Now he will say that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall dwell. Look at it with me, verses um, five and six. Says this. Um, you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verse six, excuse me, verse six, excuse me, verse six. It says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. King David now, sitting on his throne, meditating on his life, thinking about what he had learned from God in the mountaintops and, and, the, and the great times of life, thinking about what he had learned from God in the valley where it seemed as if he was there by himself. And he comes to the conclusion that if you were with me in verses 2 and 3, and you were with me in verses five and six, um, I mean 4 and 5, you shall be with me to the end. David says, at no point of the psalm have you not been with me. David says, my terrain has changed. At one point, I was on the mountaintop, and I was overseeing kingdoms, and I was destroying enemies, and I was seeing the, the children of God grow in Christ. At one point in my life, things were on the mountaintop. Life was good, but at some moment in my life, I hit the pit, and I found myself in verses 4 and 5. But what, what I've come to realize is this. No matter where I found myself, you were with me. Vertical Church. The beauty of Psalm 23 is, though the terrain of your life may change, God does not. Though today was full of laughter and joy, and tomorrow is full of suffering and pain, God does not change. Do you see why Dr. Evie Hill was stuck for four hours on that one phrase the Lord is? That God exists in the eternal now, that he always was. He is what he was. He is who he is. He is what he shall be. I know that's bad grammar, but that's perfect theology. That God does not change. And David says, I've been able to sit back and survey my life. And I realize. That every ounce of my life, when, when I was being led by you, you were always there with me. And so in verse 6, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow. He, what he's saying is, he's saying, if God was with me back then, surely he shall be with me now. He, he says, um, he says um, goodness and mercy. Uh, this word mercy uh, simply means his steadfast love. His a said. And, and, and goodness simply means um, um, his support and kindness. And, and what David does now is he, he takes God's uh, 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 goodness and also God's mercy and he couples them together in a perfect marriage, meaning that's a perfect incubator for the Christian, meaning that no matter where the Christian may be, they shall be engulfed and covered and protected by the support 
and the steadfast love of God. I love it. Um, uh, Bishop G. Patterson would call uh, this verse, um, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. He would call them um, uh, goodness and mercy escort. <laughs> what he's simply saying is that the goodness of God and the mercy of God shall escort me all the way through my life, even through his throne when I get to heaven. That God's goodness and mercy is simply pushing me along. What, what lags behind me is not my sin. What lags behind me is not my mistakes. What lags behind me is not my failures. But what lags behind me is the goodness and the mercy of God. Simply saying, son, I was with you in verse 1. Son, I was with you in verse 2. Uh, daughter, I was with you in verse 3. Uh, daughter, I was with you in verse 4. Uh, son, I was with you in verse 5. And son, even when you take your last breath on earth, I shall be with you then. David says that God's love and mercy will escort me all the way through my life on earth and usher me into his kingdom in heaven. And oh, when I get there, I will lay down my crown and say, hallelujah, thank you, God that you never left me by myself. Goodness, mercy of God. True story here. Um, <laughs> in high school, um, I, went to Northern, um, I went to Northern High School, so I'm from Durham. And in high school, this, this, is, real, this is real stuff. Uh, as a senior in high school, my mama would come and sit in my class. First of all, you know how embarrassing that is? You are, I'm, I'm 17 years old. And my mama would come and sit in my high school classes. First of all, I got a little girlfriend, right? So you know how embarrassing it is to walk down, you know, walk down the hall with your little girlfriend. Somebody say, Psst, Ricky, your mama here. Girl, get off me. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm like, like that, I mean, that you, can't, you can't be cool when your mama's sitting in your classroom. I mean, and, and what was frustrating was she happened to be in every class. I, I mean, she knew my schedule back to back. She would come and make sure I was on my P's and Q's. But it was so frustrating because she literally would, would, would come, she literally would walk me to my class. I mean, I'm just like, man, you ain't even trying to just boy get married or nothing. I mean, you know how embarrassing that is, man. But when I think about goodness and mercy escorting me, I think about my mother. Though it was embarrassing, it was the idea that when I was in class and I looked behind me, there she was. And sometimes when I was uh, trying my best to not be caught with her, she would walk ahead of me to my next class, and there she was. It was the idea that when I looked behind me, there she was. When I looked in front of me, there she was. It was the idea that, son, someone is coming to make sure that everything in your life is right. Goodness and mercy. When I looked in front of me, there it was. When I looked behind me, there it was. All to make sure that, son... I am here to make sure that what you do in your life is right. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. David says, I have went through life and I've remembered the goodness of And I remember that even in my most darkest days, he never left me. You know what's funny about Psalm 23? It's only six verses. Only six. But in those six verses, David writes the fullness of life. Verse 1, life starts with God. Verse 6, life ends with God. And everything in between, God walks with you. <sighs> David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want for rest, for he makes me to lie down in green pastures. I I shall not want for refreshment, for he leads me beside the still waters. I, I shall not want for forgiveness, for he says he restores my soul. I, I shall not want for guidance, for he leads me in the paths of righteousness 
for his name's sake. I, I shall not want for companionship. For yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I shall not want for comfort, for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I shall not want for, for, want for, for provision, for thou preparest a table before me in the presence of thine enemies. I shall not want for joy, for thou anointed my head with oil, my cup when it's over. I shall not want for anything in this life. For goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall not want for anything in the life to come. For I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. David says, let me just remind you. Let me just remind you of who God is. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. David says, I shall not want for rest. For he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Shall not want for refreshment. For he leads me beside the still water. Shall not want for forgiveness. For he restores the days of my soul. I shall not want for guidance or wisdom. For he leads me in paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, I, I shall not want for companionship. For yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I, I shall not want for comfort, for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I, I shall not want for provision for God to make a way for me, for, for, for he anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I, I shall not want for joy. I shall not want for anything in this life. For goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. David says, I, I wrote Psalm 23 just to let you know that if you have forgotten why I call my God my shepherd, let me just remind you. I think someone watching today has forgotten why David wrote Psalm 23. He wrote Psalm 23 as a praise to God and a remembrance to God's goodness of who God is. I am living testimony I have seen the provision, the grace, and the mercy of God this morning. Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside still water. He restoreth my soul. Mm. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea. Tone changes. Yea. The battle is fought here. Yea. Tears flow here. Yea. The hopelessness sets here. Yea. The grief and pain and sorrow live here. Yea, though I walk. The valley, shadow, death. I do not fear. Thou art with me. It's as if David gets his bearings together. David admits that he's had some low days. He admits that he seemed to lose his, his mind. He admits that pain and grief have sunk in his heart. But he says, Yea, though I walk the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. See him rise. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. See him take courage. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of thine enemies. 
See him take his mind back. But he, he says, prepare a table for prepare my he says, He says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. He's taking back his courage. He's remembering who God is. He, he reminds himself that, that, that he should not want for anything. For he says, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. David says in verses 4 and 5, I simply had, had lost the remembrance of who my God is. Yes, sir. The word seems I got it back. Friends, I, I hope this time in Psalm 23 has reminded you of why you and I can say, God is our shepherd. He provides for you, He cares for you, He guides you, He walks with you. 